I grew up in Massachusetts, just south of Boston, and it made me uh, quite aware then of the greatness of the Mass General Hospital. A string of good fortune resulted in me graduating just 50 years ago from Harvard Medical School and entering here uh, our surgical training program. It was 1961 and I had just graduated from my school in Maine and my sister was living down here and I came down here to Boston with the idea of maybe I could find a summer job. That's how it all started. After the revolution in Cuba, I was uh, 19 years old and we decided to leave Cuba because I think we run out of opportunities. I run out of opportunities. Uh, and so we got together in a 16 foot boat, 25 horsepower, we crossed the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Took about three days. We got picked up in, uh, in Key West by a Coast Guard, US Coast Guard, to give us a choice to go to the West Coast or the East Coast. So I chose the East Coast because I used to read about Boston and the culture in Boston. There was a Cuban refugee center in the basement of an apartment in Beacon Hill. I spent one night there and the next day I said, we have an interview for you to, to work at Mass General Hospital. And I said, wow, sounds good to me. I came from the University of Pennsylvania, which uh, at that, that time, most uh, of the interns at the MJH came from Harvard Medical School. They took a few outsiders, and for some reason they decided to take me. I knew Charlie Sanders' story, and I had met him, I think, during interviews, and I always wanted to be in Boston. So I combined Charlie Sanders and Boston and applied for this and was accepted. But I came here without a formal cardiology training, and I wonder how many people had a cardiology training at that time because there wasn't that much to learn uh, beyond what you learned as a senior medical, medical resident. I found a very interesting city um, which was very different than the one we live in today. That was when the West End was here. Two colleagues and I rented a place there, but unfortunately some wise planners decided to eliminate it and the people who lived there had nothing to say about it. Most of them were renters. The eviction notice was delivered by a crane coming down the street and taking a bite out of the roof from the building in which you were present. And that was a sign you'd best move on. All around the Mass General Hospital, uh, huge swaths of the city had been demolished. So the Mass General was an island of stability in a sea of rubble. When you get out of medical school, you suddenly realize you know a lot, but you don't know what to do with it always. And the same for getting out of residency, although uh, I spent the last six months of my residence a year at Mass General as chief resident, and I had two residents and a medical student working for me, so I had a team. And so, you know, I had to make some decisions, but I always had a mentor I could call. At that time, the MGH was, was significantly or largely a, a, a hospital made up of private practitioners who donated their time uh, to to teaching of the residents and the fellows and the medical students. I went into private practice of rheumatology, uh, but I continued to be affiliated with the what we called at the time the arthritis unit, now the rheumatology unit, where we would uh, volunteer uh, our time to teach the fellows and the residents. We'd go to the clinic. We also went to medical clinic at the time. Nobody ever got reimbursed or paid anything for doing that, but that was an MGH tradition. I had learned from being in the Mass General Training Program from the surgeons and the internists, the importance of excellent doctor-patient relations, something that I was very grateful to have been exposed to. I felt that I'm working with intelligent people. The place with this reputation attracts intelligent people, people who want to do something better as it comes along. I would say it's fair to argue that the MGH was the premier academic institution. If you wanted to do research and take good care of patients and see how those two entities could mix together, those two uh, styles of interest could mix together, this was the place. From the first day that I checked at Mass General, I was assigned to do a room. And the, from the beginning, I felt that was my room. That was my patient. When I had been a medical student at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York, 
And when I had been a city hospital intern and resident, I was very disturbed. The Presbyterian Hospital in New York uh, was very selective in its admissions, and it often turned people away if they had routine conditions that could be easily taken care of in a city hospital. They also, I came gradually to realize, turned away some patients who didn't have insurance who had life-threatening conditions. Mass General, from the time I came here, prided itself on never turning anybody away. When I came to the uh, Mass General, I was introduced to the Baker Memorial, which to me and everybody else was an innovative system of caring for people. Poor people who came to the hospital here were taken care of on the ward service. Anything that was done for a patient at the Baker, regardless of how long it took or how many operations or whatever, the total fee to the patient was $150, and that was never changed. The day that I arrived at Mass General was the day Medicare went into effect. And I remember being told by the chairman of the department at that time, Alexander Leaf, that Medicare was going to revolutionize the way departments of medicine funded their faculty and paid for medical care of indigent individuals. You had to learn te tactile techniques to diagnose people in those days. You didn't have many assisted, assisting devices. Those days you just had a floral that was antiquated, you can see images, you do coronary or ventricular angiograms, but you really didn't have much detail. It was a lot of attention paid to the physical exam, heart murmurs, mm -hmm. details that uh, were very fun to um, try to sort out. The pace of medicine was very slow. When a patient had a heart attack in 1957 and was admitted to the MGH, the treatment was for bed rest for three weeks in the hospital. So there were a lot of patients but they didn't move with the speed and the numbers of tools we had. You know, we had electrocardiograms, but we didn't have intensive care units. We didn't have a lot of the monitoring that goes on now. And they had a long machine, and those they composed of a, this stainless steel disc plates um, inside a, a glass container and with a motor on it. You know, it looks like a pulley with a wheel on it, it just gently turns so as the the disc goes through the blood, and the, the pump is to, perfuse, to propel the blood into the body when you go in cardiopulmonary bypass. It was just a, what you call a finger pump. And it was pretty efficient. Uh, if, you know, the, by gravity, the pump sits in the bottom and the oxygenator was in the top. And send, so by gravity, you fill up the tubing. And as you fill up the tubing, it squeezes the section that is filled with blood and it pushes in going forward. It was a time of, uh, of creation. We were in a lab on Bullfinch 1. Charlie Sanders had an office right next door. He designed it so that his door opened into our lab. He could sit at his desk, watch the monitor, and if he saw someone foundering, he could open the door <laughs> and say, yeah, move it to the left or something like that, and close the door. So um, that was a real pleasure. He had just built a biplane lab and it was quite attractive at the time. Uh, in retrospect, it's kind of archaic. When I started, there was a school of nursing here. And it was so interesting to see the, the students because the first year ones, you know, had the check dresses and the black stockings and the aprons and, and then the next ones up, you know, were dressed differently in all uniforms and caps back then. It's not the same at all. I mean, we're sitting in a building that never existed here and right across the street from us is that small office building which used to be the home of the person who ran the hospital. Of the time that I started, only three buildings remain. The Bullfinch building, the White building, and the research building. All the other buildings have been demolished, revamped, and modernized. All of these years it's been buildings up, more coming down, more going up, but they had a long range plan in place years and years ago, and they've just about fulfilled that, I think. We've grown a lot with our outlying clinics. We've tried to bring our MGH medicine and expertise to people in the uh, communities because not everybody can travel into Boston easily. 
in terms of teaching of the, of the students and the fellows and, and the residents, it's much more formalized. When I became chief at uh, the Department of Oral Surgery, I thought it was important that our residents have more exposure to both medicine and general surgery and petitioned the chiefs of uh, both the medical service and the surgical service to ask if my residents could have a rotation on their services. Alex Leaf was the chief of medicine, Paul Russell at that time was chief of surgery, and they both agreed. So all my residents were able to spend at least three months on each of these services during the course of their years of residency. The residency program at that time was two years, but our average day was at least 12 hours. We were on call every third night. Now I see that the cardiac fellowships go four years before, uh, and that the catheterization fellowship is a year. Uh, and then every other stage, peripheral arterial procedures a year, uh, structural procedures a year. In the past 10 years, I uh, left uh, my practice and joined the arthritis unit, the rheumatology unit full time, uh, where I'm a clinician and a teacher and involved in some clinical research. I think this has been the best uh, nine or ten years of my career. The future is wonderful. Uh, my years in medicine, uh, really over 50 years, have been incredible in terms of the advances we've made. The 50 years before that were very good. They got radiology, they got antibiotics, they got a whole bunch of stuff that they didn't have before. But I think we've made a quantum leap in the last few decades. I have been joined by some outstanding academicians who have come from other countries and uh, been here t with me 25 years. If you're asking me, do I think I'm still uh, necessary, I think, no, I think I'm redundant. But there are a few projects and a few things that I'm identified with. I am retired from active surgery, that's true. But I am not retired from participating in the activities of the service and the hospital, working with the faculty and the residents and students from school. I think I still have something to, valuable to offer, even after all these years, and I'm doing a lot of mentoring for the um, newer people coming into my, because I work in a very specialized little subdivision of the blood transfusion service, and not very many of us are as skilled or um, used to doing it. We know the more you exercise the brain, the better it works, and the longer it works. The, the brain absorbs 25% of your cardiac output, and so I think it's a good idea to feed it. One thing that hasn't changed, it's the attitude of the employees. I think the people who work here are very willing to listen and give you the opportunity to go forward with your ideas. Since I first came, I, I couldn't help but notice. There was the dedication and there was the, the attitude and the cheerfulness and um, just the atmosphere towards patients and towards each other. Collegial meritocracy and patient care are built into the fabric of an institution. They're not stated rules. They're the operating uh, coda of the place. My affection for the hospital, for the people here, is very real. And I think that, that I am treated here so graciously by everybody makes this a very pleasant place for me to be. The one thing which hasn't changed is the quality of people that work here. And we have to be proud, and I am proud of it.